This is Ross Jones, your business coach with my weekly podcast show, Bold Business Bits, coming to you from Yorkshire. This is where I have a great conversation with a phenomenal female business boss. We share some of the bold stuff they do, lessons they've learned, adversities they've overcome, and the fun they have. And then I'll be dipping into my toolkit and sharing a top tip. Business can be lonely, so make sure you join us each week and be part of our show. Hello and welcome to the Bold Business Bits podcast show. This is Roz Jones and today I'm joined by Cherie Federico, founder of Aesthetica. Hello, Cherie. Hi, how are you? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. And thank you so much for joining me today. I've um, heard so much about you for ages and finally managed to, to get you here. So tell me about the magazine and how you came to set it up. Well, it is a very long story because I set up the magazine almost 20 years ago. So there's a lot that's happened in that time period. But I'll give you the abridged version. So as you may be able to tell from my accents, I am not from these parts. So I'm from New York originally. But interestingly, I think I've now spent more time living in the England than I did in America. But that's a different story for a different day. So um, when I was in New York, I was doing my undergraduate degree and I did a uh, internship for a magazine and it was a very transformative experience and I kind of knew that publishing was for me. I mean as a child I had always wanted to work, um, be a photojournalist for National Geographic. You know I asked for a subscription when I was 12 and subscribed until I was like 18 years old. So magazines were always a big part of my life. You know I used to read Rolling Stone and as I said National Geographic and um, you know then things like Cosmo and Harper's Bazaar and things like that as well you know so I did this internship and it was a transformative experience I actually learned what happened in the world of publishing um it was only a small magazine nothing that and you know anybody would even really know it was more of a journal really and when I came to York to do my master's degree I was looking for a magazine to do an internship at now you got to remember this is back in the days of the internet being dial up yeah. so and the idea of just google it didn't really exist so the idea of me putting into a search engine like magazines in the north of england or you know because obviously i could have gone to manchester or leeds or you know even if i'd done like a week in london or something but it didn't occur to me to do that so i was trying to find something local to work on and after six months of actually feeling pretty disappointed that I wasn't really pursuing something I was so passionate about. It was a Sunday in November 2002. I said um, to Dale Donnelly, who's the co-founder of the magazine, I said, I think we should set up a magazine today. And he was, he, and you know, I had like an A6 piece of paper and drafted out what it would be like and what he would do and what I would do. And I said, let's make some posters and let's go hang them up. So we set up a email account it was uh, art and writing at hotmail.com. <laughs> and um, we made some very rudimentary posters on Microsoft Word. There may have been some clip art in there, funny. <laughs> and um, which actually I have found those and they're very sweet. They're like an artifact from the past. Yeah. Anyway, we went and we hung them up around town and the universities and news agents and things like that. And so, of of course, the magazine, when it was first launched, was a submission-based publication. Aesthetica is not that now, but it's very organic, very grassroots, very DIY, and put all this effort, hung up all these posters. And then by later that day, three people had emailed us. It was very exciting. Yeah. And so... We, you know, collected some submissions over, um, you know, a period of a couple of months and then um, started putting the magazine together. I mean, the the name Aesthetica came about because we were looking at the word aesthetic and because of my accent, um, especially because it used to be much stronger, you're thinking, really? I mean, it really was. (laughs) And I I used to kind of go, ah, there'd be a lot of inflections after I I spoke. So we were saying aesthetic, aesthetica, and that's aesthetica. Oh, that's a really good word. Um, And so that's where the name came from. And, you know, there was a lot of challenges with that because actually, you know, it wasn't funded. Um, We, both of us don't don't come from bank of mom and dad or anything like that. You know, we've all both worked really hard for everything that we have. We both paid our own way through university, et cetera. So 
I thought I got some quotes from some printers and they were really high. And I remember sort of crying into my hands thinking we're not going to be able to do this because we're just not going to be able to get the money together. And then I had a light bulb moment, which was, why don't I ask a variety of printers and get quotes from a number of people? Um, and we did. And we found one we could afford. I mean, I say we could afford. We got an egg credit card out and we started oh, yeah. this business on a credit card, which was quite an interesting way to do it because it meant that we always had a debt and we always knew that we had to pay that debt back and that debt was personal. Um, and so the first issue was published in March 2003. Um, it was stocked in Borders, if anybody remembers oh, that. Oh, yeah, I remember Borders. Yeah, Borders, a good store. Yeah. Um, nationwide, so they had yeah. 36 stores. People say, how did you get it stocked in there? Yeah. I went in, I said to the person, in whom, the manager of the magazine section, I've made this magazine, I want to sell it in Borders, what do I have to do? And he said, well, I shouldn't really tell you this, but here is the phone number for the buyer in London. Call him and have a chat with him. I called him. I sent him a sample copy. He said, yeah, there's definitely a market for this. And he took it. And it was kind of as simple as that. And wow. then away we go on the, the journey of Aesthetica Begins. So That's the thing, isn't it? So that's amazing. So the thing is about if you don't ask, you don't get it, do you? So that's the thing. Just take no. some you know just have to take that bold step so that's amazing so and how has it developed then since those days because you uh, said it was used to be submissions and now well it's stunning do people like i'm i'm sure they're well how, yeah how it's commissioned that? now yeah, it's yeah. a very very different kettle of fish so you know the magazine i mean the first issues one to ten were actually a5 so issue 11 we went to a4 and there's a huge like evolution, you know, like in terms yeah. of the pagination, in terms of the design, the design has changed considerably, the content has changed considerably. So some of the key kind of moments to really understand how the content has evolved kind of goes with like our distribution channels. So in 2007, we got national WH Smith distribution. And so the store, the, the magazine's now stocked in about 615 WH Smith stores, and that's high, st high street and travel. So when you have that level of distribution, it really changes your content because actually you're needing to really be looking at this from a national point of view and actually kind of like developing our voice and our voice as like a leader in visual communication and visual culture. And actually the thing that makes Aesthetica magazine so unique is that we're basically looking at the world around us and commenting on it, but through the lens of art and culture. So we're looking at the climate crisis. We're looking at gender inequality. We're looking at racism. We're looking at, you know, every major topic that exists today. And we're looking at how art can help us to make sense of the world. So really, as the distribution channels um, changed, the whole editorial structure of the publication changed. And we have a network of journalists now worldwide oh, okay. that write for us because in 2009, we gained exports. Um, and so now the magazines, well, then it's quite a long time now is exported to 20 countries. Wow. Um, so it's stocked really well in the United mm. States, Australia, New Zealand. Um, but you can get it in, you know, you can buy it in Tokyo or Seoul or, you know, it's, it's all over the world. And so actually the distribution now is uh, 900 and 15 outlets um, with more coming. So actually it's a very, very different publication to what it was when it started. And when I look back at that time, it's very fond because I was very young and new and everything was, um, everything was a new experience. Yeah. So. Yeah. And so that's, a, it's, a, uh, it's just a fabulous journey actually to hear that. And when you read the content of it, you can, well, it's clearly global from the content of it and I was going to ask you actually how do you get everything in there but you've got people all over the world just sending you stuff or do you pick a topic and ask them to find something um to no it doesn't no because we don't really take pictures so it doesn't really work like that either I mean the, the content is really quite tightly controlled yeah. in what we're producing so actually as a team uh editorial team we clearly we get press releases from everybody and their brother around yeah. the world um and you know some of them are good but we do a lot of research and we'll be looking at 
exhibitions and shows and events and things that are happening worldwide that are of are noteworthy yeah. and are things that are actually really challenging the status quo. And that is stuff, that's when it becomes very powerful for me when it's things that are transformative. Yeah. Um, and so we will be sort of scouting around and looking to kind of covered like you know the the best of the best that's out there and again it doesn't really like we're living in such a global world right now like it doesn't really matter if you can't get to la to see it this yeah. exhibition it reading about it or logging on online or seeing something virtually with it is is you know it's not as good as being there in person but the point is is it's about knowing that these things happen and yeah. they exist and these conversations are taking place yeah absolutely fab so that, and it sounds like that, you know, in a, in a, a potted uh, version of your history, but what about, you know, it's a business, so, you know, we know that success doesn't happen overnight. How did the, what about the challenges on the way? How, what's it been like? Is it? Um, well, no, it's not easy. It's not easy to launch an independent magazine with a global feel from a northern city, <laughs> which is famous for Vikings and chocolate. <laughs> So it's, you know, in the beginning, obviously it's difficult to get people to believe in you and it's difficult to get people to take you seriously, but you know, you have to just keep on keeping on. And, you know, I've, I've got this, you know, a saying, which is really always just about ignoring the naysayers, yeah. but the, the company is actually bigger than just the magazine. And I think this is the, the thing, I mean, Aesthetica as an organization, we host a BAFTA qualifying film festival, which is a really large event um, that takes place every November, you know, screening films from over 60 countries. We have the Aesthetica Art Prize, which is an annual exhibition, it takes place in York, which, you know, there's like over three and a half thousand artworks that we go through and that gets short, long listed to 125 and then 20 artists go on display. We host a symposium called the Future Now Symposium every spring, which is about a conference around kind of like big, big topics in contemporary art and visual culture, design as well. And so as a as a business, the company diversified quite a bit. And yeah. so, you know, it's, it's, you know, if we're talking as a business, it's about, you know, developing different income streams into the yeah. company. And yeah. so, you know, we have a variety of ways, you know, from events and exhibitions and things that we do, which, you know, form the whole of our offer. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds amazing. And the, the film that I was going to ask you about the films, actually. So how did that, how did that happen? How, was mm. that your brainchild? So the film festival grew out of the magazine. Again, very long story, but of the abridged version is in the magazine, you know, there's, you know, it's art and culture. So film forms a part of culture. Yeah. And so we always had, you know, from a journalistic point of view, editorial on films, those films needed to be released in the cinemas because obviously the magazine, again, this is before the world of VOD and streaming yeah. and things like that. So if you were a reader, you had to be able to go see a film in a cinema that we were talking about. But we were continuously contacted by f filmmakers who had made films who wanted, you know, traditional methods of marketing, as in they wanted editorial about their work. And we couldn't always do that. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if we published a DVD, so this, again, it shows you the time period, of short film that that was went out with our Christmas 2010 edition, you know, and then we'll organize prize money, screenings at different festivals, this big package. The problem was there was too many films and a DVD is only two hours. So there was maybe just under a thousand films that came in that first year. We were able to choose 12 to go onto that DVD, which meant basically everybody was rejected. Now I set up this company with the founding principles of supporting and championing outstanding talent. So when I had to turn away some seriously talented people, it didn't sit well with me. It was I was very upset about it. I was very troubled by it. But the D the magazine came out, the DVD came out. But then in January 2011, I was invited to BAFTA to speak to filmmakers about how they could work with brands like Aesthetica Magazine. At the end of that, there was a good 40 people waiting to speak to me, politely queuing up, and they all said the same thing. I sent my film in, you rejected it, can you tell me why? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was very humbling, but again, in terms of like transformative moments in your life, mm -hmm. very transformative because I realized that I had a bigger responsibility here than what I thought I did. Because we're talking about people's creative work, we're talking about their passion, we're talking about their mm -hmm. dreams, you know, and I have to be respectful of that. And so... On the train ride back between 
London and New York, that good two hour journey, I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll start a film festival. Yeah. It'll take place in the city of York. It'll be multiple venues because York is such a beautiful place to come to. And there's so many amazing venues. I thought, and we'll we'll kind of use all of York's nooks and crannies and we'll we'll do like a cin like a cinematic playground. And so the first festival was 12 years ago and you know, in 2014 we got BAFTA qualifying status and the festival has really grown you know, a lot in that time period to become one of the UK's leading festivals for new talent. It's extraordinary, really. Um, I definitely, you know, when you sit back and you think about it, I didn't think I would do that. So, <laughs> but I'm glad bucket. I did, you yeah. know, and I love it. So, yeah, yeah it's just, uh, it's fabulous. And so with all this, you know, you've got this like global influencer in this space, Sherry, haven't you? So what makes you stay in York? Well, we almost moved to London. I mean, it's a long time ago now. It's 2006. So I was looking at accommodation um, at the old Truman Brewery on Brick Lane. I thought we need to be in London to run this company. And um, interestingly enough, like a month later, I won the Young Business Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Cute. <laughs> no, fabulous. Well deserved. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, it's a long time ago now. <laughs> I feel like the trophies, are, yeah, it's just up there yeah. behind that photo. And uh, and basically, I won that award and then, you know, attracted a lot of attention locally and we were we decided to stay. And then as we just developed our team, our employees lived here. Or, you know, we've had a lot of people um, commute over from Leeds over the years, but obviously it's only 20 minutes away. So as you build your team and you start to establish yourself – you know, it doesn't make sense to kind of move away from there. Plus, I mean, this is a really nice place to live. Like I do, I mean, I've lived here for, like I said at the beginning, I've lived here almost longer. I have lived here longer than, <laughs> than when I lived in America, or it's maybe ha right, right smack down the middle. But I just think it's, um, it's just a really nice place to live. And actually it affords a lot of opportunity. Like if I were to have launched the film festival in London, it would have just been swallowed up by yeah, London. Yeah. We're doing it here. I can get the whole city involved yeah. and everybody can be engaged, you know, different businesses and restaurants and things and venues. And it becomes like this really amazing experience where, you know, you see people walking around the city of York wearing yellow lanyards and running from different places, like venue to venue to go see these really amazing films. So you know, our offices are right in the center of York. We're in a Tudor building. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I do really love living here. You know, I've got a little girl now. So she's, you know, a proper York girl, Yorkshire, yeah. Yorkshire lass, as they would say, I guess. Does you she know. have a York accent or a New York accent? She has a York accent. <laughs> um, she does say tomato, which, and, you know, um, there'll be a couple of other things. Or if she comes across a word that she doesn't know yet and I'll hear her repeat it in my accent but um no other than that you know she 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 definitely sounds very Yorkshire <laughs> yeah okay and uh so thank you thank you for sharing your just amazing story Sheree but you know I like to ask my my guests about maybe a, a time of adversity that that you experienced along the way and um and what came out of that well you always learn from challenging moments in your life and I think if you're open to kind of embracing the good as well as the bad and what life can throw at you, then you will eventually come out of that situation much stronger. You know, I mean, I can give you a million stories of things that have happened along the way whilst setting up the business. But I suppose personally, you know, I mean, I grew up in a single parent house, you know, my father passed away when I was a child, and it made my mother very sad for a long, long time, like my entire like teenage years. It wasn't really till I left home to go to university that things were quote, um, well, there is no such thing as normal, but <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, and so, you know, I think life throws a lot of challenges in front of you. And I think how you, how you respond to things, I mean, that's, you know, that, that kind of how you can, accept thing I mean you know you cannot change everything and there yeah. are certain things in life that you have to accept and they become part of who you are I mean 
I am a really hard worker and maybe that has something to do, <laughs> you know, with how, you know, my, my sort of formative years in the sense that if I wanted something, I knew I was going to have to work hard for it. Yeah. So, you know, but I'm just one of 7 billion people on this planet. And I'm really aware of the fact that many people will have every person will have challenges that they faced in their life you know that's part of the human story it's part of the human condition there's going to be births and deaths and you know i'm not trying to sound super pragmatic about it but in the sense that i know that this is a shared feeling that okay. everybody has and so i guess i never saw myself as you know going through some exceptional amount of grief in the sense that i was very cognizant that people all experience certain moments of adversity or pain or loss in their lives. It's how we, I guess it becomes part of the person that you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Shuri. It's been an absolute delight to speak with you. Thank you. Well, thank you. In our conversation, Shuri talked about transformative experiences that happened after taking bold steps. One thing that was clear to me when speaking with Cherie is that she is consistently bold with big ideas and lots of action. And this podcast is dedicated to bold business women. So what is bold? Being bold means not hesitating or being fearful in the face of actual or possible danger or rebuff. It's the possible rebuff that stops us being bold more often. Deciding to be bold may lead to negative outcomes. When you say no, go against the grain or challenge the norm based on what you truly believe in, you may face rejection or retaliation. However, when we're in the right and we eventually find the courage to speak up, it can be really rewarding. It can help you get others to respect you more, give a voice to the oppressed, get out of an unjust situation, make a real difference in your community, get what you truly deserve and bring people together. And it's vital in business too. So when you're just branching out into the world of business, it can be difficult to find your confidence. Some of the best advice you will ever get is to be bold, regardless of how far-fetched your goals seem. No matter how crazy your dreams and goals may sound, put it out there for all to hear. Being bold gives you a voice. Being bold is fascinating and rare, so people are always going to be interested in what you have to say. Being bold is a huge part of building your brand and marketing yourself. Make your plan big, a little bit crazy, and tell it to anyone who will listen so your voice becomes louder than everyone else's. Being bold actually builds your confidence. When you set a goal and say it out loud, it becomes real. The more you talk about your goals, and even the ones that may seem far-fetched, the more confident you'll become that you can achieve them. You'll begin to believe in yourself more than you ever have before. As your brain begins to believe what you're saying, you'll start living your life in a different way. You've got this superpower, we all do, so reach for it. Being bold is motivating. You might start your business motivated to succeed, but maintaining that motivation can be tough for the long haul. Anyone tells you they never have down days or days when they question everything they're doing is lying. Practice being bold to see a difference in your motivation or your lack of motivation. Being bold attracts the visionaries. As a startup or newbie entrepreneur, it can be hard to make connections with game-changing individuals. Being bold and putting yourself out there will gain you newfound confidence and that confidence will attract those revolutionary individuals. These individuals can assist you in taking your startup from beginner to expert in less time. Whatever that game changer is, whether it's a business coach, a marketing company or any other professional, it's going to be worth pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone for that. Being bold is exciting. When was the last time you were truly passionate and excited about getting up for work in the morning? Most people just coast through life, not fully enjoying it to its potential. When you become a bolder person and put your vision out there, your feelings will follow. You'll be living a life more exciting daily than you could ever have imagined. Being bold will truly progress your business and reputation as an entrepreneur beyond what you ever imagined. So ask yourself, what have you done to be bold today? And what are you going to be bold to do tomorrow? This has been Ross Jones. Thank you so much for listening to our Bold Business Bits podcast show. Please subscribe to our show and I'll see you next time. This has been your Ross Jones Bold Business Bits podcast show. If you'd like any further information about anything we've discussed today, please just get in touch. Go to businesscoachingyorkshire.co.uk. 
Please join me again next week when I'll be speaking with another phenomenal female business boss with bold business bits. And remember to subscribe to my show. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.